Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you on this beautiful Saturday morning. Oh, the sun is out, the birds are singing. What a great day. So far, so far, so good. Hope you're looking forward to a good day. And I tell you what a good way to start the day than being in the Word of God and sharing some thoughts from the Scriptures this morning. Carol, good morning. Tracy, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Yes, yeah, so uh, sharing some thoughts from the Word of God. Good way to start the day. Good way to kick the weekend off, I think. Alan, good afternoon or good evening. Good to, uh, good to see you. Brother Michael Ross, good morning. Ian and Glennis, good morning. Uh, hope you're praying about tomorrow. I'm excited about tomorrow. I don't know whether it's a preacher thing or what. I don't know. But uh, looking forward to being with God's people tomorrow. Brother Tim, good morning. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Yes. Well, all right. Let's get going, shall we? We'll get started. And I'm sure there may be some others that, that will jump on as we get going. Luke chapter 17 this morning, the gospel of Luke. Now, you know, uh, Luke, written by Luke. Hey, how's that? Uh, who was a physician, he was a doctor. Now, would you agree with me that when you go and visit your doctor, most doctors are pretty detailed uh, in their writing down of things, if they're writing a prescription, if they're sending you for blood tests, um, you know, they're sending you for a scan or whatever it is. They, they have to be very detailed and precise in what they're writing because, I mean... You know, you don't want to send uh, someone for the wrong blood tests or whatever. And I know it happens, right? I get that. But more often than not, they've got to be very detailed. Someone's life could be at stake. If a doctor is not detailed and precise in what they're explaining or what they're writing, it could, it could lead to uh, something very disastrous, which would be unfortunate. It would be very unfortunate. Well, it's interesting when you read through... Luke's gospel. Luke normally, normally is a very detailed writer, whether it's his gospel, whether it's Acts, uh, he gives a lot of detail. But there are times when he doesn't give detail. Now I want you to look at Luke chapter 17 for a minute. We'll begin in verse number 11. I, I love the word of God. You know why I love the word of God? Because there, there are things that, uh, that, that, you read it, you read it, you read it, and, and and each time you read a different passage, something different comes out. And that's why we should never get uh, bored with the Bible. Uh, it's a living book. It's a great, it's a great book. Of course, it's the Word of God, and it's alive. It's quick. It's powerful. Um, but just little things sometimes that God reveals, which is which is amazing. All right. Anyway, we've all read this passage time and time again, dealing with these ten lepers. But let's just have a look at something here. Verse 11, it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not 10 cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. What a great, what a great story. What a great account. Now, when you read it, you think, okay, well, we're, you know, Luke gives some detail. He talks about... You know, in the midst of Samaria and Galilee, it mentions 10 lepers and, you know, uh, nine, Jesus, where are the nine? And there's only one that came back. So he, he, he gives a bit of detail here. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something in verse number 12. As he entered into a certain village. It doesn't give us any detail about this village. It doesn't let us know whether the village was a big village or a small village. Doesn't let us know whether it's a prosperous village or a poor village. Doesn't let us know whether it's a beautiful village or a barren village or what. He doesn't go into any detail. He just says a certain village. And folks, Brother Jack, good morning. 
Here, here's the thought for this morning. Because sometimes we get hung up on a certain place. We give a lot of credence to a name or a title. Now, I'm not discounting that, all right? But sometimes we give a lot of credence to a name or a title. But it's not so much the name of a place. It's not so much about a building as a place. It's what takes place. So it's not the place that's important. It's what takes place that's important. Luke, again, doesn't give us any detail about this certain village. But he gives us detail as to what takes place in this certain village. I remember many years ago, a preacher who's with the Lord now said this, you can be in the wrong place doing the right thing, which is better than being in the right place doing the wrong thing. Now, I agree with that to a degree. All right. A degree, uh, we're still looking at the place. We, we put a lot of emphasis on the place. Now, now I, I'm all for praying about a place to go. For example, say planting a church. All right. Planting a church, missions work. A lot of missionaries get you know, touched by God or, or God speaks to them and says, I want you to go to Australia or I want you to go to Vanuatu or I want you to go to Africa. And, and they, go to a, they, they, they go to a specific place. Or they go or talk about church planning. Oh, you know, I'm going to go to New South Wales, or I'm going to go here. Whatever. You know, in reality, it to to be quite honest with you, it doesn't matter where you go. It matters more what you do where you are. You know, it's like you know, Jesus said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, am I discounting praying about it and seeking the Lord's direction? No, 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 I, I'm not. However, we hang our hat very much on those things instead of just, there's a need over here. Let's go to, you know, wherever. and Because it's not so much about the place. It's what takes place, which is more important. Now, I want you, we're going to come back to this in a minute. But I want you to go to another. I want you to go to another passage. I want you to go to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five. We're going to come back to Luke seventeen in a minute. Because I tell you what's. I tell you what's the most important thing. The most important thing, as I said about what takes place, because what takes place is a result of Jesus being there. I want to ask you a question. What are you praying about tomorrow? You're going to go to a building and, and, you know, again, look, again, I don't want to sound pedantic. You know, I'm not really against this. However, you know, we put a lot of, we build church buildings or multiple buildings and we dedicate this building to this person. And we put their name there and we're going to, you know, ladies meeting is in this you know, we mention the name of the building or whatever it is and, and all of that. Can I be honest with you? It, it doesn't really... Naming a building is not really important as much as what takes place in the building. Uh, listen, I'm all for name. Baptist, I'm a Baptist, all right? Such Heritage Baptist Church, all right? I get that. I get the title. I get the description. I get the identity. I get that. But I tell you what's more important. What takes place will give you an identity. So I want to ask you a question. What are you praying about tomorrow? What are you asking the Lord to take place where you're meeting tomorrow? Firstly, as I try and encourage a lot of you, I, I often try and encourage you to be praying for the presence of the Lord. There's no presence of the Lord. Nothing's going to take place. Nothing of any significance, of any importance, unless Jesus is there. So that's the most important thing. You, you, can, you can, hey, I, I wish, pray, I wish that Heritage Baptist Church had our own building. But it doesn't matter whether we own a building or whether we rent a building. What's more important is what takes place in that building. Am I right? 
Thought I heard an amen somewhere. All right, I want you to go to Luke chapter 5. All right, Luke chapter 5. Let's look at verse number 12 to start with. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city. Luke doesn't give us the name of the city. Doesn't give us a description of the city. Just says, here's a certain city. Behold, a man full of, le full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face, besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. You see, it's, it's not, what's not important is, is the description or the name of the city. But what's important is what took place in the city. You know, when we think about Christianity and we think about our city, Brisbane, or wherever you're located, what's taking place? What is the Lord Jesus Christ doing through you personally? Or what's he doing through your church in there? Because that's, my, that's, my, that's what's most important. Right? I want you to go on down a little bit. I want you to go to verse number 16. All right? Verse number 16. He withdrew himself into a wilderness and prayed, and it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee, and Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling of his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins be forgiven thee. Whose house? What's the name of the street? What's the name of the house? What's the name of the building? It doesn't matter. What's most important in Luke's detail is what took place in that house. Now, Mark's account, Mark's account, let me just read Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, verse 1. He ended again into Capernaum after some days. There was no noise that he was in the house. Now, some people might say, well, he just says the house because it was a house that he frequently went to. Brother Ross Denford, good morning. But Luke doesn't tell us the name of the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word to it. So he was preaching and teaching in that place, that was what was most important. What took place was most important because what took place, because he was preaching and teaching, the power of the Lord was present to do something in the lives of those people. These four men took advantage of that, went up on top of the housetop, broke it all up and let the man down into that and the man's life was changed forever. So it's not the name of a place. It's not the place. It's what takes place. Let's go back to Luke 17. So here we've got these 10 leprous men. People who no longer assimilate into society. People who nobody wants to be around. Loners. Uh you know, despised, looked down upon, talked about. When someone sees them on the same side of the street, perhaps, and someone sees that, that person goes across the other side of the road because he doesn't want anything to do with anyone that's got this leprosy. These men were in trouble. But I don't think the name of the place the location of the place, if you please, was what was really on their mind. It was the very fact that Jesus was there and they called out to Jesus and what took place in their life was what was most important. I want to go back to that original question. What are you praying and asking the Lord to do tomorrow? These men, if you think about it, come on, let's be honest. It, this was a radical life-changing event that took place in their life. 
Are we praying about that tomorrow? Are we asking for the Lord to be present in our midst tomorrow and that he has his will and way in the service and his, his power in, is, is present because preaching or the teaching of the word of God is going on? Now, I don't want to say this just because I'm a preacher, but, you know, like I said before, and hey, I, I, we, we, we looked during the week about worship, all right? And I'm all for worship. I'm all for corporate singing and, and all of that. And, and I believe it ought to be done a certain way and, and all of that. And I understand that some people can be touched. But you never see in the Bible that people's lives are radically changed through a worship service. But what you see, whether it's in Luke chapter 5, or in Luke chapter 17, it's, it's the word because the life, Jesus is the word and the life that was in the word that went forth. And they called out, Jesus, have mercy on. And he said, just go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were obedient to the word. The word was spoken or the word was preached. The word was taught. And these men had a radical, life-changing event take place. Are we praying about that tomorrow? Are you praying about that tomorrow in the church that you are a part of? Are you praying, Lord Jesus, be you in the service tomorrow. Have your will and way. Touch lives. May there be a radical change in people's lives, even in my life. These men were restored. Restoration took place. Are we praying about that tomorrow? Is there someone that you know that perhaps is far from God and not being, you know, what they should be and all this sort of stuff? And instead of looking at them perhaps through a, the corner of our eye, like we would look at these leprous men and sometimes we look at brothers and sisters in Christ who perhaps are not walking like they should and we treat them like lepers. Why don't we pray that Jesus does a, a restoration in their life? And by the way, when it comes to restoring, guess who he's going to use? You and I. Are we praying about restoration? Are we praying about a, 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 something, a radical life-changing event for people tomorrow? These men will never, ever forget what took place in their life wasn't about the place, it's what took place. What about revival? I've been talking about that. It's something that's on my heart. It's something that I've been pr praying and preaching about and so forth. We're we praying about that tomorrow. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is sovereign. There's no of that. There is no doubt. God is sovereign, and and, and God can act, and and God can do whatever He chooses to do. I mean, He He is God. He is. <laughs> you can't have the title of God and and not do whatever you want to do. We get that right. But we also understand that our God does work in accordance to our praying. Do we desire revival? When you go to church tomorrow, are you praying? Oh, I don't know if everyone else is praying. It doesn't matter. What are you praying about tomorrow? What are you desiring for the Lord to do in the midst tomorrow? Like I said, I'm all, you know, again, you know, titles and names and all this sort of stuff. And I think sometimes they can be more of a stumbling block to what the Lord wants to do. It's not about that. Luke doesn't give us any detail. A certain village, a certain city, certain house, a certain man. No detail. The detail is not necessary. We don't need to know the ins and outs of what's taking place or what's it, what, the, what the place is. But what's taking place is the most important thing. So let me encourage you as you... Go about your day to day. You're probably very busy today. We've got a lot of things on your mind, a lot of things that you've got to do. But may I encourage you to just take a little bit of time and sit before the Lord and, and just pray and say, Lord, we're, we're meeting in our church tomorrow, your church. And preacher's going to be preaching and Lord, we desire your power to be present to do a work in the lives of people that are there tomorrow. Reveal, reveal the, the secrets of men's heart. First Corinthians 14. 
All right, let, can, I, can I close with that? Because I just love this. I really do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to close. I know, I know some of you are busy and you're going to get preaching tomorrow and you've heard me all week and you're like, I've had a gut for, I've had enough. <laughs> all right, 1 Corinthians 14. Look at, verse number, uh, look at verse number 23. If therefore the whole church come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? But if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Notice the report. Hey, God is here. Why? Because of the name of the place? No, because of what took place. This, the secrets of this man's heart, as uncomfortable as that would be, were revealed. And he's like, God is here. Let what takes place give identity. Let what takes place let people know and say, wow, God is here. God is here. Be specific in your praying for tomorrow. All right? Pray. And say, Lord, we want you to be you in the service. And we're looking forward to what is about to take place in our church tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, we're certainly thankful that we serve and, and know a living God. Lord, we do believe that you are sovereign. We, we confess that. We know that you are sovereign. You are God. Lord, we certainly do come before you and pray about our services tomorrow and for those who are ministering. And Lord, we pray that what takes place tomorrow will firstly bring glory and honour to you, but will change the lives of people in such a way that they know they've met with their God. Lord, help us. Prepare our hearts, I pray. May we be expectant. May we be confident. And may we rejoice in, about, in, in what's about to take place. Bless us, we pray, as we go away. Lead us, guide us, protect us, we ask. Give us opportunity to be a spokesperson for you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me this morning. Thank you for joining me all week. I really do appreciate it. Trust it's been a help and a blessing to you. Uh, God bless you as you attend church tomorrow. Remember what Jesus said. You shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. Uh, I'm starting tomorrow night, the series in the book of Habakkuk, finding rest in days of trouble or troubled days. And uh, if, you, if you have a mind to, uh, join me tomorrow, five o'clock. Looking forward to it. Anyway, have a great day until tomorrow or until Monday morning. God bless you and I will see you then. Bye for now.